Okay. <clears throat> okay, we're recording live. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for stopping by. Our guest today helps people get unstuck in their daily lives. She currently works for one of Canada's largest health authorities. Prior to becoming a transformation specialist, she works as a humanitarian. She worked as a humanitarian aid worker for the United Nations and several NGOs in several war zones around the world. Guys, if you like what we're doing here, please like, share, and subscribe. This episode is sponsored by Todd Palmer's number one international bestseller from Suck to Success, a guide to extraordinary entrepreneurship. Guys, but without further ado, Lisa Bornellis, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? I'm well. I'm honored to be on. Thanks for having me. Well, Dev, that was a good, uh, your energy level's up there, man. <laughs> I'm <was> stoked, like... <laughs> dude. I know. I've been feeling so hot these last couple of days. So, you know, I'm just stoked to, to have you on the show and stoked to talk to you guys. And yeah, it's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. You're on the, on the rebound. That's how it happens when you, you're not feeling so good. Then you come out of it and you just feel like a million bucks. You take That's off, true. That's right. True. Yeah. So, um, so at the very beginning of every show, what we do is something we call two truths or three truths or four truths and a lie. And <laughs> it gives our listeners a little bit of a chance to kind of, kind of know a little bit more about, or maybe not know about, um, our guest, right? So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to read out these uh, these little items here, and then Devin and I are going to guess which one is the lie, okay? All right, so you ready, Dev? Sounds good. Okay, so, okay, here we go. Um, from Lisa here, I have a black belt in Taekwondo. Mm-hmm. Yep. I remember uh, Reiko, my, my wife and your mom uh, was into Taekwondo for, and got into she had some sparring when she was pregnant with, I don't know if it was you or Kina, but yeah. Um, oh, maybe that would explain some stuff. I was going to say sparring while pregnant. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then after like, a while, uh, people wouldn't spar for with her anymore. They refused to spar with her, but strange. she took it. I wonder why. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> um, number two, I worked in Afghanistan and the Balkans. Wow. Nice. Okay, so we've had, this is our second person that's worked uh, in, in Afghanistan that we've had in the past couple of weeks. Uh, so that's interesting. It's very topical. Um, I have six rescue bunnies. Damn. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then another one here. I am an author of a children's book. That's really cool too. Mm-hmm. And last but not least, I will deliver a TEDx talk next month. Wow. We're loaded. We're loaded with things here today, Dev. What are you? <clears throat> yeah. So what, what, what are we going to go for here? Okay. I, I believe in the, yeah, Afghanistan one and the, and the, the yeah, the, the, that's for sure. The black mm-hmm. belt, that makes sense. I can, I can go with that. Rescue buddies. Sure. Author of children's book. Yes. TEDx talk. Yes. I don't know. This is a, this is kind of a tough one. Maybe, you know, maybe yeah. you have one rescue bunny and it's just a play on, it's just a little play on the play. On yeah. Yeah. Know. It's Let's like Chelsea. It's like Chelsea. We had the, uh, up in Pemberton, she had a bunch of chickens, right? But it was like the yeah. number of chickens. Um, yeah. I'm going okay. with, uh, one, one rescue bunny. We were so one tricked. instead of six rescue bunnies. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to say you've worked in Afghanistan. Yes but not in the Balkans. So oh, it's kind of a half, interesting. kind of a half truth thing there. Okay. All right, so, how do we do? Yeah. So can I do the big reveal? Yes. Devin is spot on. Ah. I have a re- rescue dog and I have a free roaming rescue bunny, a lop eared dwarf and the dwarf bunny bosses the dog around and the dog <laughs> rolls over and gives the bunny the belly. Oh, but if I had my man. way and a bigger house or a bigger lot, I would, I love animals. I would be rescuing everything. It, it would be a very good zoo. <laughs> Incredible. No way. Nailed uh, this. <laughs> you did. Yeah. Oh, yes. man. So, yes. and for Nigel, I did work in the Balkans in um, Croatia, Bosnia, and Kosovo. Okay. That was going to be my question here because I, there's got to be a backstory, we on, get the backstory. on some of this because we, we're really fortunate. Um, a good friend of ours is a documentary filmmaker called Chip Duncan out of Milwaukee, and he's been to Afghanistan multiple times. And what we did is we interviewed him about two, three weeks ago again on when the US and everybody was pulling out of Afghanistan. And so we're going to ask you so, what was it? I mean, when and what was it like to, to work in Afghanistan there? Yeah, so in 2007, I was working Mm -hmm. for War Child UK, and I was overseeing their international program. So I was really lucky. I got to travel to all of our different program sites from Afghanistan to 
Uganda to um, wow. Kuwait. At that point, we couldn't get into Iraq. So um, I spent some time with our program leads there on the ground in Karat and in um, Kabul. And mm-hmm. uh, this was 2007. So Hamid Karzai government. Um, this would be a good six years after the um, initial um, movement of troops in international community moving into Afghanistan. And I took some fabulous shots. Uh, I had to be very discreet working um, there on the ground. We weren't traveling around in our big marked NGO vehicles or anything. We would travel around incognito in local taxis because it was still tense. And if you were an international worker, gone are the days of um, honorable war or respecting the Geneva Conventions. You could be kidnapped. You you could be held for ransom. And so um, I have some great shots where I thought I would arrive and women would not be in burqas. And yet there they were walking around. They didn't have the level of freedom of movement. And nor did I as a Western woman, which was um, very disheartening and shocking. Mm -hmm. But there's been, there was some progress in the 20 years um, that we saw the international community present. And I'm so distraught to see what's happening to women and girls right now under uh, Taliban rule. There's been no change. It's been devastating to see that the international community has just effectively stood by and watched these horrible images that we're, we're seeing and the desperation. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, I know it is, it is a bit shocking. I know what, what Chip uh, mentioned and he, yeah, he actually shared some photographs too with us um, of, of his time there. And he, you know, he just said, I mean, the people are just wonderful. And he was in some very, very remote areas and just wonderful people in an incredible country and stunning, um, scenery too you know it's absolutely incredible and i mean he actually invited our family to go with him this is three years ago um he said you know what you know it's it's pretty tense you know in, in Kabul, but you know we'll, we'll you come with us we'll go into Kabul. we'll stay one night in a safe house and then we'll go into the uh into the north or wherever it was and we'll do a backcountry ski touring trip and i'm like you gotta be kidding me he goes no he said actually it's it was uh, it's an incredible place he has a lot of friends there and there's certain areas that are hot spots, but you know, he, at that time he said, yeah, we, you know, we, we'd be okay. Now I, you know, it, it's changed again with the Taliban, yeah. um, the Taliban, the Taliban. I, I watched the documentary the other day. It was on Netflix and it was really, really good. And I can't remember. It was, you've probably seen it. It's about, uh, it's a documentary filmmaker. I don't even know who he was, but he follows a child all the way through into his, tw- he follows him for 20 years mm-hmm. in, in Afghanistan. And it's really, really wealth. I think it's probably called it a child's 20 years or something. Um, but this, it follows this boy. He's like five years old. And, and, the, and this filmmaker keeps going back every year and, and sees how he's going. And he's living in some little remote village. And, and it shows him getting kind of, um, kind of put under the wing of this, this documentary filmmaker and taken into, into Kabul. And he actually becomes a cameraman. And he, I'm going to spoil it, but the last shot in this film is of him filming the American troops leaving Kabul just a few weeks ago. So it's just, oh it's like, whoa, it was, it's a stunning, it's a really well done documentary film. I'll have to look at that. Yeah. I just want to um, reiterate your friend's experience of all the, I've traveled all over the world and had the privilege of working around the world. Mm-hmm. And um, I have never been treated more graciously or with more hospitality than in Afghanistan. It is such a deeply ingrained culture this um, this spirit of hospitality. I have Greek roots and we call it uh, xenia or uh, philotimo. And what that literally means, it's such an in, ingrained deep practice. It's this notion that when a guest comes to your home, you give them everything because it's the same as God coming to your home in disguise. And I truly experienced that in Afghanistan. So I find it perplexing that a a country that is so warm and giving and incredible and beautiful also has this dichotomy of uh, of so much brutality and its leadership. And um, I'm betting that your average ordinary person there is is really struggling and doesn't want to live like this. And that's what we're hearing. You see people falling off the plane wheels because they're desperate to get out. Yeah, I know. Yeah, those those scenes were just yeah shocking, shocking. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you were in the Balkans too, for, for a while as, as well, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of my earliest stints when I graduated um, from graduate school, I, I studied international relations. I got an internship with the United Nations. And so I started working um, in Kanin, Croatia, which is just on the Bosnian border at a time when 
um, Croatia threw out its Serbian population, but we had a lot of returning displaced persons coming back. And so we were in a sticky position in that, um, obviously we are trying to help refugees return home, but the local population isn't thrilled because they've taken over the houses that the Serbians want to reclaim. And so we were, we were working in that context of, at the time. So it was an incredible experience as a young person. Wow. Yeah. And, and yeah, go ahead, Devin. No, I was just wondering, like, how did this all start for you? Like, when did you decide to, to go down this road? What was, what was that moment where like, when I was a kid, I, I remember, do you guys remember Live Aid and the images of starving African children yeah. and Bob Geldof so you give me your effing money. Um, so those really resonated as a child and I wanted to become a doctor and work overseas. Long story short, I suck at math. <laughs> so <laughs> I got into, I started sciences at UBC, but then I, I switched to international relations as a major. And um, I'm so lucky that I actually got to live my dream and work in a career area that I really wanted to for a good 10, 12 years and then came back to Canada. Wow. That's amazing. We've got, we've got some backstories on Ethiopia and the fact like we were, we were, Devin and I and our family were actually there in about three years ago with Chip Duncan, this documentary filmmaker and his, his connections and his people there. And Salim Amin um, is, is somebody in Nairobi, Kenya. So his father, a Mohammed Amin, real quick story, um, was the journalist that actually got into the Quorum Plateau in, uh, in Ethiopia in 1994 or 1984 and got, you know, risked his life, got the film footage out, got it to be, um, was the BBC in London, then got it to NBC or something in the United States. And that's what the whole Bell at Bob Geldof thing was because of his footage and wow. the stories. Yeah. The story is yeah. incredible. So yeah. And that's another, that's another side. There's so many really interesting. It's amazing the things stories. that impact you and then pivot your life in a particular direction, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And, that, and now you're, so now you you've got a Ted talk next week, which is really cool. And I want to talk about something here, um, which not a lot of us, you know, talk about a lot is, is OCD. So you you mentioned that I've got a stat here that you say one out of 40 people globally have OCD and OCD stands for again, do you know what it stands Obsessive for? Obsessive compulsive disorder. That's, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. So my so, wife, Reiko is a little OCD. Hey, Devin, your mom. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're all a little bit. So let me dispel a couple of myths. So OCD isn't the cutesy condition where you like things just so. Organized with the labels pointing out? No. Yeah, no, no. It, it's not that. I mean, I know we use the expression <laughs> like I'm so OCD, but actually right, right. It, it is a debilitating neuropsychiatric disorder. So imagine the thing you are most afraid of in the world happening. Yes. And imagine your mind telling you, to, if you don't submit to that compulsion, something terrible will happen to you or your family. Now imagine being a child and mm. experiencing this and how burdensome and terrifying this is. Mm -hmm. Imagine being a parent and feeling very guilty. Have I created a trauma that caused this, et cetera. Mm. And so my son was diagnosed uh, when he was eight years old, a couple of years ago, prior to the COVID pandemic. And I was so lucky, BC Children's Hospital, um, we got into a research program through there and he was given a very specialized treatment called exposure and response therapy. And through that, he was able to, to use the tools uh, where rather than us feeding the monster and uh, supporting him to go through the compulsions, we're actually doing the opposite, which is really hard as a parent, right? Your kid actually has to be uncomfortable. And so where he was initially afraid to eat, say, pears with spots on them, yeah. he would actually be fed them in, in the therapy. And that actually disempowers the voice. So it's, very, it's a very complex um, situation and it, it, it's very challenging, but it's very little understood and we don't see supports in the school. And then that's what inspired that next pivot in life or, or journey to, um, to write this book, Louis and the Dictator. I wanted to um, do a couple of things. Oh, I wanted to. I think you froze there for a second. To create more awareness and understanding of the condition, they can be the heroes of their own stories. And so I weave in some of the therapies in a, a fun so, way as part of an adventure. Sorry, Lisa, story. could you say that again? I think you froze for a minute. 
for yeah my goal in writing this is I want children to know that they're not their thoughts Mm -hmm. no matter how terrifying and I want them to know that they can be the heroes of their own stories Mm -hmm. children with mental health conditions are often not represented well in literature they're either a silly sidekick or a ridiculous character or a frightening character And so Louis and the Dictator is a chance for them to, in a safe context, live an adventure story and through the main character, understand that there's tips and tricks they can use to deal with anxiety or shift mindsets. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that by raising awareness as well, I'll be donating a portion of my royalties to BC Children's um, Pediatric OCD Research Clinic who helped my son. So that's where all of this started. Fantastic. So, so like right now we're living in a really interesting time after, well, after, I don't know if it's still, still going along is, is this COVID um, pandemic. And I mean, what I've noticed and is that it, it must be really, really, really difficult for some of these kids and adults that have now we've been locked away and now we have to go back out into society and there's that anxiety. I get anxiety. I mean, I get anxiety. Um, you know, okay, wash your hands and all this stuff. I can't imagine being somebody that has OCD. And now it's like, and it's basically been told, okay, this thing's could kill you if you don't do this and that. So exacerbating it. I mean, I see it. I mean, I actually see it in my office as well with some, some people that, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, it's been really, really, really tough on them and their families. Um, yeah, this whole, this whole period. So yeah. So, Absolutely. Uh, right. COVID has, is it an, it's created an unnat- unnatural condition for us as human beings wanting connection. We've all experienced in the last 20 months, some level of anxiety, fear, loss, deprivation, grief. Um, and in that pattern that can trigger for people, maybe with an underlying disorder or an existing disorder, an exacerbation of that. Yes. I work Uh, for one of Canada's largest health authorities right now. And we're seeing that at least 10% of our emergency room visits are mental health related. We're consistently over 108% over capacity in our mental health beds. We need to start treating mental health as a serious condition that needs treatment like cancer, like heart attacks, like so many others. Yeah. Wow. And in October, this month is is, um, mental mental health month. That's right. I think it is. Isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and October 9th through 16 was OCD awareness week as well. Right, right. And, and uh, you know, uh, even recently, you know, we were seeing even in the Olympics um, with athletes and then also in the NHL where where people are now like, you know what, I, I need to back away because the, you know, the mental stress on being, you know, high performance athlete, um, it's, it was in tennis, um, recently it was in the Olympics and it was in the NHL where these people are, are finally, you know, um, proud or, um, brave enough to stand up and say, Hey, hang on a second here. Um, something's not quite right. Right. And, uh, yeah. It's wonderful when high profile people can speak to um, Mm -hmm. what's going on for them because it helps dispel myths and it helps to really quash stigma. Imagine a couple of generations ago, people would hide away children with Mm -hmm. autism, OCD, um, mental mental or or physical disabilities. So by raising awareness, I hope we can (laughs) really crush these, these myths. Yeah, yeah. So would you have, so as, as, a, as a parent yourself, <clears throat> would you have any like wisdom that you could share with other parents that, you know, we're now at the point where, you know, the, the kids are going back to school and, you know, there's, there's a lot of them out there that are terrified, you know, they're going in, they have to wear a mask. You have to wear a mask in class and you got to, you know, keep washing your hands. And um, it must be extremely, um, just so much anxiety around that for these for the kids and parents and parents going back into the office, you know, um, would you have any, any little tips or things? Um, yeah. Um, deep breath one day at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, keep thinking about what, you know, is true, purposeful and useful in the moment. So, um, testing some of your thoughts or anxieties, you know, if you find yourself spinning, uh, being able to just check, 
is this true right now? Um, mm -hmm. Or is this something I'm worried about in the future? Might be a good place to start. Or recognizing at times you're not your thoughts. So sometimes we get overwhelmed by whether we're mad, sad, depressed, overtired. We get thoughts in our head that it can be pretty awful. Mm -hmm. And that's just your brain doing its thing. It, it's not a reflection of who you are. So you can let that go as a, as a um, if that's something that's weighing you down. Mm -hmm. um, so is yeah, your brain, is, is your, when, when all those thoughts say, say, say for me, example, I would wake up at five o'clock in the morning and you're, you know, you're kind of in between, you're in that, you're not asleep, but you're not awake, you know, you, but then your brain just starts going crazy and you can't go back to sleep and all these thoughts. I mean, is that your brain just processing? Is it just processing all these things? Um, I'm not a neuroscientist. Yeah, I'm just wondering what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. I, and I'm not a neuroscientist, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it is quite normal. So what I understand are in basic CBT, our cognitive behavioral therapy, our thoughts will affect our feelings, which affect our behaviors. And if you're kind of wired like me to be, to be anxious by nature, um, I really have to be very conscious uh, and test those thoughts out. So what can I control right now? What is true and fit for purpose in this moment? What can I do to shift the pattern and try something in the future? And so I actually talk about this in my TED talk. Um, mm -hmm. I, I congratulate everyone who will attend in, um, in their ability to thrive or survive in this massive period of uncertainty. That is a testament to our resilience. And then I will talk about, you know, what if we take the patterns brought forth by uncertainty and transform them into opportunities for, um, for blooming, for growth, um, for possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I use my son's example with um, the application of exposure and response therapy around how he's able to do that. And so hopefully that will resonate for people who are perhaps feeling a bit anxious at this time. I mean, I know I was dealing with anxiety and I, I do talk about it quite a bit, you know, during COVID and Devin, Devin really helped me out with uh, some breathing exercises. Cause we were, you got me into the Wim Hof breathing, um, all these different types. And it really, and then we, you know, we did the, the ice cold plunges as well, but the breathing is kind of the key and it's really, really helped me a lot. I mean, we do it pretty much every day. Um, just, just starting the day off and, and, uh, it just kind of sets the day and, and, and it really helps me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm glad you raised that because there's little micro breaks you can take in a day. So I'm thinking of our emergency room doctors yeah. or people working in war zones or Marines, right? Yeah. Something goes off. You just need to take that breath. And all, all of the science and the studies show that that moment of just pause, deep breath actually sends a lot of um, oxygen to your brain, allows you to reevaluate very quickly and, 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 and make decisions more clearly. Um, the science behind why we're so frightened by uncertainty and change is because my understanding is blood is reduced from our prefrontal cortex, where most of our considered thought processes take place, then that affects our amygdala and we get this fight or flight response. So that breathing helps to just calm in the moment um, and I guess ground or reset. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I'm not a professional or a therapist in this area, but that's roughly my understanding. Yeah. There, there's an incredible book that, um, that we've, I've actually, I've got the audio version. I listened to it twice. Cause it's so, it's so good. It's called breathe and it's called, uh, James Nestor, I think is the author. And it talks about the lost art of us of breathing and the power of the breath. And it's think, funny. Uh, you mentioned that my colleague yeah. just sent that. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. The podcast. It's very, it it's very good. It's very good. Okay. I have the, I have the audio book and there there's, there's all sorts of stuff and it, it, it can help all of us for all these different ailments and things. And it's just, some of it's very simple and it's our breath. We've forgotten how to breathe. Yeah. 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 It's um, it's, it's incredible. So, yeah. So, so your Ted talk is it's next month. Do, oh, uh, do you have a day for that? Do you know what day that 20th is? 20th of November. 20th November and it's SFU, right? Simon Fraser University, I believe. Yeah, I think um, it's going to actually be staged at, in New Westminster and the, yeah. the theater there. I'm just getting that sorted, but it is sponsored by uh, TEDx SFU. Right. right and right, the right, theme right. is bloom, and so I think uh, all of all of the all of the speakers are are really running with this post pandemic, um, based on some of their really cool experiences and expertise. 
And right. so I bring in the world of change management and um, complexity science mm-hmm. in order to oh, to development. And, and what I do is I blog and I have a pod and apply the tools in a structured change management approach to your personal life because that's not something talked about. And I argue that um, as human beings, we're all complex adaptive systems. So complex systems are things where you have a lot of interdependencies, they don't function in linear ways, things like climate change, poverty, the big issues. Well, we as human beings, we're not linear either, we're not rational, and we are complex adaptive systems in our own right. And so I talk about how we can take situations of uncertainty and really transform them into possibility using a a particular tool that I'm familiar with. Oh, I think you within my field location. And I use my son's story as an example. Right. And then your so yeah, your son's story and then the book. Um so so when did you publish the book? When did you release the book? Yeah, end of July. It was uh I mean, oh so it's fresh. fresh it's fresh, very fresh. new. Yes. And it's in various, I, I saw that you have it in various uh, brick and mortar um, bookstores all, all over the place, right? Like A couple locally, chapters. mostly it's online, but online, um, yeah. shout out if I'm allowed to, to 32 books in Edgemont Village. They've been really yeah. supportive. Um, Odin Books on Broadway, um, they specialize in books for children with neurodiverse or uh, mental health needs. And apparently uh, downtown chapters Indigo on Robson Street was willing to take some copies. But otherwise, it's online and all your usual Amazon, Barnes yeah. and Noble chapters, yeah. etc. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Good stuff. I know because I, yeah, I, I, uh, I wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago, and yeah, it took me three years. I think it was over three years, and it's quite the process. So, yes. yeah, my my hats off to you for that. And then you have illustrations of yours too, so it's much more difficult than than uh, than what I put together there. So, yeah. I have to say the story came out in six weeks. So the writing, I love the writing part, but I've had to learn a lot about um, digital marketing and skills that I had, you know, no idea. Um, I have to market all of this on my own. The cool thing is 10 years ago, a person like me would have to go through the big five publishers and it would take years. Exactly. Or like yourself, right? You can drop podcasts, you can create music. And so this opens up a world of creativity, except we don't have the big firms behind us to market. So Thank you for this opportunity. Very yeah, grateful. That, that's right. No, 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 no. No, it's it's fantastic. Um, Dev, do you have any questions there at all? Um, yeah, I do. I actually do have one. I'm going to take you back a little bit here. So I just want to know, like, what would be your, let's say, one to three key points of wisdom that you've acquired over these years of learning that you would go back and tell that that young woman who was inspired by Live Aid? Like, what what would that, what would you have to say? Oh, <clears throat> Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. What great questions. Um, try and ignore imposter syndrome. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah that, you, that, one. That, that you are good enough and that if you try, um, set an intention, uh, whether you're, uh, whether you're a person of faith or you just believe in the universe helping you. I found that setting attention, an intention towards something has been quite magical. People have helped me so much along the way with this writing journey, um, yourselves included. When you set an intention and put it out there, um, somehow these little breadcrumbs and opportunities pop up. So follow them and just keep following your dream. That sounds a little cliche, but that's what's taking me out of a place of personally feeling stuck during the pandemic. Mm. This all started in February when I just felt like every day was a horrible groundhog day, a sick repetition of the last. And I wrote on a sticky note, what is one thing you're going to do? every day to shift this pattern of feeling stuck. And that led to the book, the blog, the podcast, and and then me talking to you today in the TED Talk. Yeah, exactly. It's all as a result of this idea of just take one step every day to achieve your dream. And so I hope that is a a piece of wisdom, Devin, that will resonate for others. Absolutely is, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I really like the imposter syndrome. And it's it's funny that you said that because this episode is actually sponsored by Todd Palmer's book. Uh, it's called From, From Suck, Suck to Success. Success, right? And he talks a lot about imposter syndrome. And um, so I, I Todd's a fr- Todd's a friend of mine, and we've talked about this imposter syndrome quite a bit because we all belong to this entrepreneurs conclave out of Boston, <clears throat> and. 
I remember the very first time where I actually got accepted to go to this entrepreneurs conclave many, like 20 years ago. And it's just like, you're kidding me. Like I do not belong in this. Like I'm dyslexic. I've got ADD. I, you know, I, I can barely read. Um, and driving up the driveway to ver for my very, and I knew that these are all under all entrepreneurs, mostly from the United States and driving up the driveway to this, this house where this, this, this conclave was going to take place with 75 other entrepreneurs. I thought I was going to vomit. I really did. And because I just didn't think I belonged, I thought I was an imposter. There's no, why should I be there? But then over the years, I realized that actually, no, you know, I, 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 I do belong here. And it's, you know, it's been, it's been quite the process and, and um, you know, being able to have such support from this, this amazing group of, of peers that I've developed over the years. I really, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of my tribe now where I just didn't feel that I would, I would fit in. So I, I just, I love what you said about the imposter syndrome and just pushing through. Cause we, you know, we do, we do belong. And, and it, the whole thing, the whole thing is just taking that step, taking that first step. And like you said, it's a cliche, but it's just that first little step, which leads to another thing, which leads to another thing. And then suddenly, you know, Lisa, you're here. And I mean, you're, you know, here in Afghanistan, you're the Balkans. And then, <clears throat> you know, you've written the book and now you do a TED talk, where in your wildest dreams would you ever think you're going to be doing a TED talk next month? I, I guarantee five years ago, you would, you would, you would just, if I came to you and I said, you'd say absolutely no way. So it's, it's just like you said, just follow and just keep pushing through and things of one thing evolves into another. And it's incredible where we find ourselves. It really is. And so, yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Amen. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, I wow. think with that, we are going to wrap it up for today. Thank you guys so much for checking in. If you would like to know more, uh, we were going to put everything in the link of the description. Definitely check out Louie and the dictator. You can find it on multiple platforms online. Yeah. Other than that, do you have any final words for us? And thank you so much for coming on the show and we'll have to have you back sometime. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this opportunity really to elevate um, awareness around OCD and um, just want to leave any parents or children who might be listening to this with the thought that you're not your thoughts. It's not anyone's fault. You're precious in your own right. And there are people that can help. Fantastic. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Lisa. Really, really appreciate it. Have a fantastic, we're at the weekend here, so a fantastic weekend. <laughs> Thank you, you too.